Cork Rugby on Off the Ball. With Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. Welcome back. Plenty of rugby news to have a look at. We've got Keen Tracy with us. Keen, how are you getting on? All good, Will. Um, I'm liking your casual look in this uh, hot weather as well. Can well, it is, yeah, it is pretty hot and being in the after ball studio in middle, middle of June talking about rugby, you know, it's uh, supposed to be the quiet time of year, isn't it? But there's plenty to get stuck into, which is probably a bit unusual, really, but I suppose the World Cup here, there's plenty going on. Yeah, like we were just saying before we come in, so we're getting ready for the top 14 final mm. this coming weekend. And at the same time, there's some clubs bringing players back for pre season, and the World Cup training camps have started, and Ireland are going to be back at it effectively from this weekend as well yeah it's our two seasons running into each other yeah it's mad like in, if you remember during Covid there was so much talk about trying to you know align the, the hemispheres in terms of the calendar and obviously that hasn't happened yet but even you look at in this part of the world where it's not really aligned at all so it's going to be very interesting to see how different teams do it there's premiership teams back already this season or this week they went back on Monday training um I see even some of the Munster players are back doing their own individual stuff. They won't be back until later in the summer because the URC season won't start until um, mid-October, I think it is. So, yeah, there's still plenty of time left to run, but the fact that the top 14 final hasn't even, you know, the season hasn't finished in France yet will be interesting. So, yeah, Ireland are going into camp um, on Sunday. I believe so they'll have their first kind of proper hit out on Monday and obviously a lot of the French players will be coming from Toulouse in particular and several from La Rochelle as well so you know around the Six Nations time there was a lot of talk that um the French had kind of, you know, beasted the, the French players in the Six Nations, knowing that the top 14 season was going to run later than normal. So they wouldn't quite have the same run into the World Cup. So a lot of French people would have said that's why France were that little bit sluggish in the Six Nations, knowing that they were trying to peak in time for, for the World Cup. So Ireland obviously go on and win the Grand Slam. So they'll be hoping that they get it right as well. So there's a lot to, there's a lot to, balance I think and get right it's not just kind of the coaches it's the S&C staff it's nutritionists all working behind the scenes so you can be sure it's a really really busy time for them as well We might start with the Ireland squad because no offence to the Champions Cup form but we can talk about that a <laughs> yeah. bit further down we were having a conversation last night and part of it was we were going you know what let's just wait till next Wednesday see how the pool sits exactly, at that point yeah. and then so we can see what happens in the draw and you can actually kind of get stuck into it but yeah plenty of angry people uh, online anyway about it So I gathered <laughs> yesterday the Ireland squad though obviously one of the big talking points that John Clane wasn't part of it initially and we were wondering after his really good season with Munster if this was a case of the Irish coaching team just not fancy him because he has been out in the cold during Andy Farrell's regime and then last Saturday we got the news from the Springboks camp that he was going to be part of their extended squad just ahead of the rugby championship and look now he's in contention to play both in that competition and potentially further down the road may even face off against his Irish colleagues at the World Cup if he was to impress over the next few months what do you make of this move first of all? There's so many strands, <clears throat> excuse me, Will. There's so many strands and ways of looking at this. I mean, from Jean Klein's point of view, it's absolutely fantastic. Look, I think he would have much rather if Andy Farrell had called him up to the Ireland squad. I've spoken to him twice this season, I think, about it. And there was an air of resignation, I think, about it. I think he, he probably figured that, you know, his face didn't fit in terms of the style of play, which we can get into whether or not that's fair enough, particularly in terms of how Munster have been playing this season. So, look. Andy Farrell, I don't know if they had they had conversations behind the scenes, but I my understanding is with a guy like Ben Healy, like Andy Farrell kind of made it clear to Ben Healy, look, that you're not in my plans at the moment going forward. So that's why Ben Healy went off to Edinburgh next season because he wants to play international rugby, which is totally fair enough. And you admire you have to admire a coach who's being honest like that with his players. So like I'm not privy to knowing if Andy Farrell gave Jean Klein a similar heads up but when he didn't get picked for the Six Nations squad you could say okay fair enough uh, but his end of season form with Munster was outstanding um, he made 24 starts uh, this season which was absolutely remarkable considering the position that he plays and the amount of work that he gets through so um he was absolutely essential to Munster winning the URC, particularly in those brutal uh, away games that, that they played in South Africa. Jean Klein really stood up. And I think the other thing you'd have to say is he's improved massively as a player this season. And I don't think that's any coincidence because you've had coaches like Graham Rountree's come in as head coach. Mike Prendergast has come in and put a huge focus on forwards being ball handlers and that wouldn't have been one of Jean Klein's strengths in the past I think he'd be the first to admit that even back in South Africa before he'd come to Munster it just wasn't his game but it absolutely it, it has to be your game now in this the attacking framework that Mike Prendergast has put in place you still wouldn't say it's his 
it's his number one strength by any means but it's improved massively so I can understand why a lot of Munster supporters will be disappointed not to see Jean Klein be brought in and given a chance because how many players have we seen over the years who've come into the Irish setup working with the likes of Andy Farrell Mike Cash, uh, Paul O'Connell and take their game to that next level and, and I would feel that maybe there was a sense of that with Jean Klein as well that if he had been given a chance he, he might have been able to kick on to another level but look if we flip it around and go from the Irish coach's point of view I can also see it, what I'd imagine is their thinking John Klein has not played for Ireland since Andy Farrell took over as head coach he hasn't played since the, since 2019 when Joe Schmidt was in charge that's why he's allowed in case any listeners are wondering that's why he's allowed to switch to South Africa now because the stand down period of three years has elapsed which World Rugby changed in 2021 now when they changed it it was designed for the likes of your Tonga that like Malachi Fekatoa, Falau, even yesterday you see uh, Adam Coleman and Peter Aki are going to be in the Tongan squad it's for the World Cup. East and Atewa back in exactly, the day. Yeah, exactly, that, that's what it was designed for. It wasn't designed for the, the world, reigning world champions to get a player. But that's not Jean Klein's fault. Jean Klein is playing by the rules here and I don't think anyone should point the finger at him either. It's a very short career. He wants to play international rugby. It's the country of I'm his I'm sure birth. his dream was to be a Springbok when he was absolutely. growing up and now that chance yeah, is there. Yeah, absolutely. So I I don't think we can we can criticize him for that either but I would imagine Andy Farrell and Paul O'Connell and like that's the other thing Paul O'Connell is one of the selectors here as well the, the book stops with Andy Farrell he's the one who's picking the squad at the end of the day but you'd be naive to think if Paul O'Connell doesn't have a massive say in particularly in the forwards and the locks that are in the training squad so I would imagine they would have felt that four years out of the system in terms of the Irish system itself is a long time and to play catch up um, it's a lot to ask now again people could argue that Jean Klein could have went in there and hit the ground running and I suppose the argument is now we'll never know because he hasn't been given a chance in the training squad like this isn't about I don't think Jean Klein going to the World Cup and being an, an automatic starter for, for Ireland not at all but I think people also have to understand that it's not a like for like all locks aren't like for like you have tight head locks and that's what Jean Klein's role is so people can point the finger at other people who are in the squad and they shouldn't be in the squad but they're different types of locks that was the whole argument of <coughs> him going in 2019 was exactly. that he, he was a big beefy player on the tight head side which Joe Schmidt really liked and it was going to balance out the squad and like if you consider some of the players and say the injury profile of Ian Henderson over the mm-hmm. last two years and say Treadwell's loss of form and a few others who you know, Farrell has obviously put faith in the past you would have thought with the form that John Klein has shown this season that he merits a place in an extended squad yeah absolutely I think the one player who's benefited hugely from this is Joe McCarthy Mm. Um, now the Ireland coaches have put a lot of stock and faith in Joe McCarthy look there's no doubt you can see the size of the guy like he has we don't produce too many athletes of his kind of size uh, natural size in this country so they put a lot of stock in him but he hasn't played a huge amount of big games for Leinster he was injured for a bit this season um, he went on the summer tour to New Zealand last year uh, you could see he was very raw uh, particularly you know giving away a lot of cheap penalties and stuff so he looks like more of a selection for the future almost you know what I mean for the next cycle now he could get in he could surprise us all and get in but if everyone's fit it's a, it's a, it's a tough ask I think for Joe McCarthy to get in but uh, I can understand people going well why not pick John Klein who's played 24 games for Munster the URC champions uh, he's been proven like I think people's memories are just maybe still kind of blotted by 2019 and, and that didn't really work out like you know he got the nod ahead of Devin Toner and people were expecting him to be this kind of massive South African lock and it did take him a while to to find his feet but like I said I don't think it's a coincidence that he has done that since the new Munster coaches have come in and they're far more aligned uh, with how Ireland are looking to play and I think the other key point in this Will is like we can sit here and talk about the merits of it and for what what should be and what shouldn't be but Andy Farrell has proven to be an unbelievably good selector like since he's come in and taken over he's made very very few few poor decisions I mean you, we think back to you mentioned Kieran Treadwell like not many would have predicted him to be a, he was the breakout star of the New Zealand tour last year Jameson Gibson Park you know Mac Hansen James Lowe all these guys who kind of came not just, not so much James Lowe but all these guys who came off the uh, off the radar a little bit so we can argue about it but really and truly Andy Farrell has so much credit in the bank when it is, when it comes to selection. So I think we absolutely have to trust that he knows what's best for this team. They're also the Grand Slam champions. It's very hard to get into that squad. I know it's only a training squad, but continuity is so, so important. And I think that's ultimately why John Klein has missed out. 
And while Munster fans might be frustrated now, they might be even more frustrated if he plays for the box mm. because he becomes non-Irish qualified at that point, which when contract renewal time comes around, that poses a bit of a problem for them. Yeah, but that's a potentially big, big problem for them because Orgy Snyman is already at Munster as an NIQ player. So you've two, you've two essentially players in the same spot. And if you all, think, all things being equal again, they'd be Munster's first choice second rows. Uh, with Ty Byrne would obviously go to six. You'd have Peter O'Mahony at seven, even though John Hodden is there now. So you have great options but if you're David Nusifor in the IRFU you don't really want to see two NIQ players playing taking up in the, in the two same positions particularly not when you have guys like Tom O'Hearn and Edwin Adogbo coming through so um that is going to be a potential issue uh, for Munster going forward so it'll be interesting to see if Sean Klein gets capped by South Africa Rassi Erasmus was speaking about him yesterday called, like you know describing him as a monster of a guy you know Rassi played a big part in Jean Klein moving to Munster in the first place in 2016 and to be fair like Jean Klein has put so much into Irish rugby into, into Munster rugby since he's arrived he's been there since he's 2016 he recently built a house in Limerick he's married to a girl from Galway they recently had their first child he absolutely loves it here you know what I mean but when international rugby comes calling you can't really turn it down so the big thing is will he get capped I mean he still has a big big task on his hands to get into the 33 man uh, South African World Cup squad but as Rassi was making the point yesterday they've had a lot of injuries over the years at lock so it only takes one or two injuries for the door to open I think there's been a bit of chat that South Africa might look to rotate for one of their rugby championship games which is coming up of any of the rugby championships that you're experimental in it's the one just exactly yeah up. and I think they're talking about maybe one of the Australia games that uh, they might you know kind of look to use their squad and that would be the type of game that you'd imagine Sean Klein could feature in. and if he does then yeah he's he's captured for one for a better term back to South Africa again so um, it's very interesting times but like I said it's brilliant for brilliant for Jean Klein himself I mean he, he fully deserves to, to play international rugby on the form that he's shown we, you'd much prefer if it was with Ireland but this is the way the cards have fallen mm. usually like this time of year is rugby writers kind of holiday time for the yeah. best part and then you get the manna from heaven that comes out of the European Cup final which is Johnny Sexton and Sean O'Brien getting involved in an argument around the referee and after the game and the potential fallout for this and like, there's obviously huge speculation about what's going to happen with Johnny Sexton and how short or how long a potential ban might be um, where are we at with the story at this stage? Um, my understanding is that like there are conversations going on behind the scenes but like I've kind of I was off for a little bit post the end of the season I was kind of like dipping back in but I think some of the stuff that was written and that's been said about Johnny Sex potentially like having to retire now because he's going to be handed a 24 was a 24 week ban is that just click Bait grabbing though. Look, I don't want to like accuse another journalist of doing that, but some of the hysteria that I saw like online, people like getting on to me asking me, is Johnny Sexton ever going to play rugby again? Is utter nonsense. It's utter, utter nonsense. Um, people have jumped to conclusions without knowing the facts of what, what actually happened or what's going on. So I think it's been a bit of a pain for everyone that it's dragged on this. Um, this long like I said Johnny Sexton's going into camp on Sunday um, I don't think they'll be overly concerned but it's still a cloud that needs to be kind of sorted out I think you kind of hit the nail in the head there Will like it's normally the quiet time for rugby riders and there's a bit of a vacuum mm. and there's been a bit of a vacuum since the Champions Cup final about this incident and all of a sudden people are trying to fill it but look all I'll say is from what I've seen I don't think a huge amount of Irish journalists have jumped on this in terms of like you know Johnny Sexton is facing a massive ban and I think you should probably read something into that uh, we don't know what's happening I'm not saying he's not going to be banned he might get a game he might get two games but I really don't think it's going to be um, it's a, not this headline we've seen of 24 weeks no, that's I, the I, end of his career I just, that's, kind of that's crazy crazy yeah. stuff and you don't know what's going on behind the scenes is, is what I would say as well in terms of you know pressure being put on because World Rugby had kind of set their stall out with Rassi Erasmus in that video a few years ago but people are trying to compare that when it's in other teams interests as well for Johnny Sexton to be you know suspended for parts of the World Cup so you wouldn't know what's going on silly games kind of behind the scenes but I take a lot of it with a pinch of salt I think yeah yeah no look well a camp gets underway as you said this Sunday for uh, the Ireland squad before we kind of touch into the the 20s as well who were preparing for the Junior Rugby World Cup the Champions Cup form I mean it did come out yesterday uh, my first instinct when I saw it come out was 
All right. Okay. We like the smaller pools again. Mm. The Swiss system of the two pools, I think, confused everybody last season and no one seemed to really like it. This time, at least you're competing against most of the teams in your pool. Not all. You won't be playing against teams who are from your own league. But there's still that element of six teams in pools of four with four coming out and one going to the Challenge Cup that's just such a massive safety net there yeah that's the thing the the lack of jeopardy is the the one thing that kind of jumps out to you and look this has been an issue for the last several years since they basically EPCR changed the format and the thing about it is I suppose Irish supporters and Irish fans have bought so much into the Champions Cup over the years but they weren't the ones like it wasn't on Ireland that the format was changed it was more on the English and the French um, so yeah, look, like even from like my own point of view, trying to be writing about this and talking about it, explaining it, it's a pain, really. Like you know what I mean? Because it changes every year. Um, the one thing you'd say is it's gone closer back to what it used to be, but there's still so many holes. Look, everyone wants to see it go back to uh, pools of four, six pools of four teams. Um, the issue with that is, which I, I feel like a lot of people are missing and keep forgetting, is that a week a week has been taken away from the Champions Cup a few years ago. So we can't go back to the original format where you play six pool games and then you have your three uh, knockout games, quarterfinal, semifinal, final. That's nine weeks of games. There's only eight weeks for the Champions Cup now. That was designed because I think the English and the French wanted one week less to focus more on, I suppose, their own leagues because that's where that's where they're getting most of the revenue in terms of what the top 14 and the Premiership TV deal and I assume the round of 16 stays because of revenue too because an issue when the round of 16 was being talked about was during COVID and the idea was this was going to be one extra round for Mm -hmm. teams to bring in more money so they were never going to strip that away I don't think no and it hasn't worked I don't think the round of 16 thing has really worked Um, so yeah like just to go back to the point like that like people who are saying we should go back to the format we we can't go back to the exact same format as things are as things stand right now because there's a week missing from the calendar so that needs to be figured out as well like my sense is that eventually we will probably go back to the way it was I mean as sooner rather than later I think EPCR to give them some bit of credit because they've taken a lot of flack like they're trying to deal with a lot of different parties they can't just come in and say this is the way we're going to do it everyone get on board because you've so many different stakeholders involved so um the lack of jeopardy, I suppose, is the big concern. And yeah, like being in teams with a pool, with it, it, being in a pool with teams that you're not going to play, it just it's confusing, really. And because so many teams are going to go through to the last sixteen, like there's going to be a few dead rubbers the, the draw is open so we're going to have the four is it four um, so top, the top seeds. four seeds and yeah. then everyone else is unseeded but you've got anyone who's in the same shield in the URC can't be drawn yeah. against each other so the two South African teams have to be kept apart and the four Irish teams will have to be kept apart which is that, that that's fine you're okay with that but you could have some massively lopsided pools here because the draw is open and it kind of makes a mockery of the, of the seedings really so like you know you mentioned the top 14 so like Leinster are waiting to see if they're going to be a tier one team this weekend because if La Rochelle if La Rochelle beat Toulouse then Leinster will take the last tier one spot on the basis that they were runners up to La Rochelle and in the, the Champions, Champions Cup, Cup. Yeah. whereas if Toulouse win they'll take the last one but I wouldn't say Leo Cullen will be sitting at home sweating about the fact it, like are they going to be a tier one team because you look at the way Leinster have been in the last few seasons of the, the pool stages they tend to just breeze their way through and I don't think they'll mind that much They pr- obviously they'd prefer to be a tier 1 team but even if they're not a tier 1 team and say if Toulouse were to lose to La Rochelle you could get Toulouse and a really strong English team exactly. to be able to draw anyway and then yeah that, that's the point and that is what's I guess wrong with the, the way the format is so um, the draw has been na- made next Wednesday um, it's, it seems mad like doesn't it like it seems like yesterday the, the final was just on I know the Premier League football fixtures came out today and it's the same thing you're just like just trying to catch your breath and all of a sudden it's on to you so I think when we see the draw next Wednesday we'll have more to get our teeth suck into but I don't think the the kind of the, the problem with the format is, is going to go away anytime soon but you'd also have to say that you have to you might have to go through a little bit of pain in terms of going through games that aren't quite brilliant but the Champions Cup was pretty good this year particularly when it got to knockout stages it delivered one of the best finals ever um, I know it's only a final but there was pretty good games along the, the way in the knockout stage as well so it is still a brilliant competition it's just the format is just frustratingly muddled I would say Did you get any line on who the two mystery teams are in the Challenge Cup? Oh I didn't actually um, I'm guessing one's at least South African though Yeah it could be but you, you might get to see like I don't know if a team from Europe you know one of the teams the emerging nations like that's a good idea in terms 
terms of trying to like build a profile in countries like I don't know like a Georgian team or, or something like that so um, it would be brilliant we, we've seen it in the past like you'd have you'd have Russian teams and, and all sorts in it so I'm all for that idea as well so um, thankfully all the Irish teams are in the Champions Cup so the Challenge Cup um, it's something you can enjoy we don't have to cover exactly, it yeah, unless yeah, one yeah, comes yeah, fifth yeah, in their thanks to Connacht yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned the top 14 final I think there's going to be a cracker mm. Saturday uh, Stade de France we're not going to see for rugby for a little while after the World Cup because of the works ahead of the Olympics so 8pm start Irish time 9pm local time at the weekend you've got the champions of Europe or two of the recent champions of Europe in both uh, La Rochelle and Toulouse um, from hearing Ron Nagara on OTBM last week it's just this mammoth season that La Rochelle have been going through and he was pointing out this like you can kind of enjoy the success at the Aviva but at the same time he knew that there was a cutthroat end to the playoff series within the top 14 as well and here are La Rochelle now in contention to do a double it's it's such a beast of a league I remember when uh, when La Rochelle had won the semi-final Rog kind of came out with that comment about oh Leinster don't have to go back and I think this is kind of what he was talking about you know what I mean I think the, the players who won the Champions Cup got the following top 14 game off um, got to enjoy the celebrations but like it was straight back into it then so um the two best teams in France by a considerable distance I think you'd say even judging by the results of the, the respective semi-finals they were both pretty pretty comfortable and it's it's strange um, La, La Rochelle for all their dominance in the Champions Cup over the last couple of years have had a bit of a thing with Toulouse where they've been a bit of a, a hoodoo for them so um, I would imagine when Raj and the La Rochelle board and the coaches also sat down Donna Ryan at the start of the season of course the Champions League would have been like a main priority but I think the top 14 would have been potentially even above the, the Champions Cup purely because they've never won it before and they've, they kind of ticked the box of the Champions Cup last year so um, I think it's going to be massive massive for them to, to win it like we've already seen what the Champions Cup success has mean to, meant to the town I mean the scenes there are just absolutely incredible can you imagine what it would be like if they won the double so um, Toulouse were disappointing you'd have to say in the Champions Cup this season so this is a big chance for them to sort of rectify that especially when their domestic form was so good so they finished mm. top of the regular standings and they blew Rasting away by 30 points yeah. in the semi-final last week yeah and they looked very very good uh, I watched the semi-finals they looked really good um, they have a lot of the French team as well which will count for something as well no different to you know Leinster losing the Champions Cup but then Munster kind of saving it so it gives you that little bit of kick when you're going into international camp for the World Cup I think that does still count for, for something so yeah I think they've, they've played each other obviously in the regular season and they've both won at home mm. each one at home but in the when Toulouse were at home back before Christmas uh, Red Awardy was sent off very early on for La Rochelle so they were actually down to, to 14 so um, you'd have to probably make La Rochelle I think slight favourites on the on the basis of what they've achieved in the Champions Cup and it would be massive for them I think to get over to Toulouse because like I said they've just kind of been there in the background constantly one of those teams where they seem to struggle against but what a season it would be for Ron O'Gara Dunica Ryan Alton Delan, Sean Dougal um, if they were to come away with a double it's so rare for teams to win the top 14 yeah. and the Champions Cup because the top 14 is such a brute of a competition and because this would be La Rochelle's first domestic league mm. title it would make it all the more special absolutely yeah I was thinking of Alton Delan because he got interviewed with us on the pitch mm-hmm. after the final look he got on for a bit of the game uh, during it as well and like you can't help but be happy for the guy uh, to have ended up in a situation where he was pursuing his options at the end of his Connacht contract and it seemed that O'Gara was a fan of his and he was attracted to go and play for La Rochelle understandably we need French before he went over and this was a great adventure for mm-hmm. him to go there he's got significant game time in big matches this season it's been a move that's really worked out well for him really well I'd say he was gutted uh, that he was dropped for the, the final because he was so good in the quarter final and the semi-final I was surprised obviously it totally paid off and O'Gara was vindicated in his selection but Delan was excellent in terms of La Rochelle getting to that final and yeah he's a really he's a really like nice guy which I know doesn't count for anything but like you like to see nice guys do well and he did take a bit of a chance by going over there but he got a real new lease of life I mean he's playing in the back row mostly for La Rochelle now Um he played in the back row a lot when Pat Lamb was in charge of Connacht um, back when he would have been much younger and you've seen the amount of destruction that he causes out in the tram lines I mean he's so so effective there so I think maybe I don't know this now but I wonder did he felt a little bit frustrated maybe he got pigeonholed maybe as this lock who wasn't doing much else and now you can see because he's always been a freak of an athlete I mean 
the pace of him the power of him and it's been absolutely brilliant yeah so you'd love to see him go on and, and do well as well because like I said he has been a real success story he hasn't gone over there and kind of made up the numbers I remember we were chatting to Dylan Lades, the La Rochelle South African winger just before the Champions Cup final and he said that um Alton Delan is kind of the, the brunch king in La Rochelle and that he's the one organising the kind of get-togethers with the lads like the card clubs and things like that so it sounds like off the pitch as well he's fitted in like an absolute dream so fair play to him Yeah uh, Rugby here on Off the Ball is with thanks to Vodafone main sponsors of the Irish rugby team we all belong to the team of us we've also got the Junior Rugby World Cup coming up the under-20s where Ireland have been really good the last few years and they're coming mm. on to this in the back of a Grand Slam going to South Africa and look everyone's going to be talking about Sam Perendegas aren't they given that Prendergast had such a good tournament he then goes on to play a bit of rugby with Leinster fits in like a glove when he goes to play at senior men's level as well and I presume like he's going to be one of the stars of the tournament not just from an Irish perspective but one of the best players probably at this tournament he is but to be fair we can get it we can get we can talk about Sam Prendergast but there's a lot of players in this Irish team who are destined for like big things I know like because I think Sam Prendergast is an out half and it's this attractive position but there's a couple of forwards in there who look like they're going on to bigger better things we can get on to them but yeah in terms of Sam Prendergast yeah look he's going into the World Cups exactly like Ireland with a target on his back I mean teams are going to know from what he did in the Six Nations that this guy is special um, all the coaches you talk to say it as well um, I'm delighted to see he is going to the Junior World Cup because there was a lot of giddy excitement post Six Nations that um he might go to, to France and obviously that could still happen I highly highly doubt it but there was talks from you know Andy Farrell should call him up to the training squad whereas he's now going to South Africa he'll be the main man leading a 20s team who are Grand Slam champions they've got a tough pool they're going to play England first up next on Saturday week they've got Australia who are very good and are going to play Fiji so that's a really tough pool so I mean he's going to go over play against players of his own age of his own calibre and get to show that he is a cut above the rest and I think that's going to be massively important for his development I mean if he was if he was in uh, Carton House going in on Sunday great it'll be great experience for him but he's going to be holding a lot of tackle bags whereas now he's going to be in the cut and trust of it next week going to South Africa as well which is an experience in itself in terms of the touring environment and things like that so and so many players now in the Irish senior squad talk about their time with the 20s and going to World Cups and how important that was in their development as well huge and it's not just Ireland I mean you look back like there's players like George Ford Bowden Barrett like, I'm just thinking guys off the top of my head who starred at under 20s World Cups and it really propelled them on it's a, it's a massively important and springboard for, for players particularly for your top players because if you were to skip this okay the, the, the unique guys and there's few and far between of them can go off and do great things but for most top players this is kind of the pathway that you go through so this is the first time since 2019 that the Junior World Cup has been on because of COVID uh, so like there's a lot of players who've missed out on like really important rugby and I've been talking to coaches about this as well and they would have had like serious concerns that the, that the fact they weren't getting to play against this calibre opposition was a real concern in terms of their development because um, other nations were able to do like in-house stuff uh, a lot of guys just didn't have any of 20s rugby at all so I'm probably not helping Ireland the good squads during the Covid years exactly like Jack well. Crowley I'm, I'm trying to think off the top of my head didn't get to go to a 20s World Cup his Six Nations got I think was his one got canned during while it was on so it's a game to play or a round to play yeah look so you can, still, you can still recover in that but it's it's a brilliant spectacle and anyone who's been watching the 20s over the last couple of years like they've been so good to watch I mean a couple of guys who I would say are also definitely going to be going to good things are two Munster back rows Brian Gleeson and Ruin Quinn who like Brian Gleeson is underage again next year and for anyone who hasn't maybe didn't quite watch the Six Nations keep an eye on this guy he is an absolute unit it's hard. A, in the England game particularly he was incredible it's hard to believe like he's underage again next year he's he's a guy from Tipperary he played underage hurling for yeah. Tip um, he's just that kind of pure farmer strength you know what I mean and he is we, I interviewed him after, on the pitch after Ireland won the Grand Slam in Musgrave Park in in March and I was honestly taken aback by just how large of, of a human he is and the thing is he still has to fill out because he's only 19 so um, he is an exceptional talent and Ruin Quinn as well who obviously became Munster's youngest player like the two of them are going to feature for years to come in the Munster back row and I'd be pretty sure that they're going to go on and play for, for Ireland as well but there's lots of talented players in this squad who play brilliant brilliant rugby which is a credit to Richie Murphy who's obviously won back to back Grand Slam Slams 
you've Johnny Sexton's brother Mark Sexton who thankfully for the Irish 20s is actually still going to stay on now and oversee this because he's taken over as the Connacht attack coach backs in attack coach uh, next season so he's going to go straight from the World Cup into Connacht's pre-season so they've had a bit of continuity they have Andrew Brown another Connacht man has gone in to take over the defence because Willie Falloon the former Ulster player um, isn't able to travel due to personal reasons so they have a settled squad uh, there's only four new caps um they're missing Liam Maloney who missed a lot of the Six Nations as well a really talented back row he's actually the first cousin of Leinster Lock Ross Maloney uh, big things are expected of him as well but he's just had such a tough year in terms of injury but they've largely have a settled squad settled coaching team they're going there as Grand Slam champions so um, it's a massive step up obviously from the Six Nations but they were so impressive in the Six Nations that you'd have to have high expectations for what they might be able to achieve over the next few weeks No absolutely especially some of those players have played really well for the last two seasons it's mm. not just even just one group maybe who are good this year um, Warren Gatlin it's really uh, got me somewhat because they often talk about baseball coaches who towards the end of the season frame things in a certain way because they're thinking about what the job interviews are going to be like when the winter comes around and they're looking for another job Warren Gatlin is contracted till the next World Cup <laughs> with Wales now I think for anyone who went in to have the scandals within Welsh rugby the financial problems within Welsh rugby which have been hanging over them really all this calendar year and then you take into account the players and the huge amount of experience that's been lost to retirement and some of that due to the frustrations around the finances as well it's not a job you'd probably covet going into the World Cup right now but for Warren Gatlin to say my eyes if they were open now again and I was having these talks I probably wouldn't have taken the job surely Warren Gatlin Mr Welsh rugby must have known what a state they were in that was the first thing that came to my mind as well Will because when I saw that he signed to 2027 I was thinking okay this is very much a long term project he knows the depths that Welsh rugby are in now I wouldn't I would say there's some of the stuff has certainly probably caught him by surprise that he maybe wouldn't have known but he would have known the problems because he would have faced most of them while he was there during his long tenure uh, previous tenure so um to come out with a comment like that was yeah really surprising he wouldn't fill you with much confidence if you were a Welsh player in squad at the, in training at the moment because I think they've, they're back and doing a bit of pre-season work so obviously we don't know what's been going on behind the scenes in terms of their training but for Gatlin to come out and say that wouldn't fill you as much confidence with it as a player going after the World Cup if this is what our head coach thinks that he wouldn't have come if he'd known no, so. especially when a lot of the players that they have lost in the last few months were players that he was calling upon at the start of the Six mm-hmm. Nations which to me I know we talked about at the time I thought the indication was he was going to try and use and squeeze the last bit of international rugby out of that group bring them through to the World Cup and maybe for him the reset happens after the World Cup and now these guys with hundreds of caps are gone before they even get to France which is probably telling as well um, I mean you had Tipperick Justin Tipperick and Alan Jones retiring was it on the same day yeah. a few weeks ago it, like, it slightly took away from Tipperick when Alan Wynn then yeah, uh, retires uh, but it felt later. pointed that the two of them had kind of come out and did it mm-hmm. together so again we don't know what conversations were going on behind the scenes but look it just points to the muddled thinking I think of Wales because like I said we had so many chats about this during the Six Nations about like what were they doing were they just going to stick for the old guys until the World Cup were they going to have a bit of both were they just going to back youth and all of a sudden they've arrived now in pre-season for the World Cup and I still don't think they're fully sure what they're doing um, I thought Gatlin was very harsh on Joe Hawkins um, the young out half who's you know decided to go off to Exeter I mean rather than go to the World Cup of Wales like it's very hard to obviously as a 20 year old and growing up I'm sure he'd love nothing more than to play for Wales particularly at a World Cup but it's a job for these guys yeah. at the end of the day and it's all well and good for Gatland whose salary is reported to be on over half a million it's all well and good for him to say oh I'm really shocked and disappointed and I'm part- you see some of these Welsh players say that like they went and were told there's no offer for you because exactly. we literally don't have the finance and they're threatening to go on strike and stuff like that I'm just not sure um if a guy is offered and I wouldn't imagine he was offered big money in Exeter whatsoever at all but whatever he was offered he felt like he had to take it rather than play for his country which is a sad indictment on Welsh rugby and all their problems that they've had on going off the pitch but I thought it was a bit I thought it was a bit nasty actually a bit throwing a young guy under the bus like that um, when he's got to look out for himself maybe if Warren Gatlin had shared some of his salary with him he might have played on but um, I thought it was harsh and a young guy who I'd imagine is probably caught up about the fact that he's not going to the World Cup but he's trying to think of the bigger picture so the one thing in Wales' favour is the fact that they're on the good side of the draw and 
that's another such a frustrating aspect of this World Cup that it's so lopsided that you have Wales could get to quarter or semi-final and they've been a basket case for the last while So and Wales do to be fair tend to be decent at World Cups as uh, Ireland know no, matter, no well. matter what happens England have had their issues Wales, Australia one of those three is going into the back end of the competition yeah it's yeah and maybe they'll be good at the World Cup but it's without going down this rabbit hole like I mean the draw is just made far far too early for the World Cup it's something that they have to look at going forward because even from a neutral's perspective you're going to have good teams knocked out early and like I said you could have average teams who were getting through it rather than having kind of the heavyweights in your in your last eight and last four so uh, that, that's one for another day it then. is no. we, can, we can whinge about that if Ireland get to a semi-final <laughs> precisely let, let South Africa Ireland France New Zealand yeah. all worry with themselves yeah. on the other side of the draw um, the last story I want to touch on with you is Italy I was a little bit surprised about this so Kieran mm. Crowley it seemed by all reports wanted to stay around and be there after mm-hmm. the World Cup but they have decided come up with they're making a change at the end of this year yeah just came out there earlier I was really well sorry there's been a few m- murmurings about it I think Lauren Labitte uh, the racing coach has been linked uh, linked with a job there so you kind of were maybe foreseeing that something was going on but um, yeah it was interesting I was having a look at the press release that the Italian Federation released earlier and they included quotes from Kieran Crowley who basically said that he's really disappointed that the Italian Union have opted not to keep him on so I thought it was interesting that that was contained in a press release it was almost like a a press conference um, if you like so I think you could you could feel his deep sense of frustration and dissatisfaction um Italy have improved hugely you'd, you'd have to say under Kieran Crowley I know they haven't always had the results to to back it up but I imagine his argument would be that the, the work that they're putting in now you can clearly see in terms of the style of play the type of athletes that they're you know producing you think of Garbisi Ange Capowat so uh, like really talented players who were going on I, play I would for, have said for consistency of performance the Six Nations this year is as good as they've had in a long time exactly yeah but I think it's pretty short sighted in the Italian Federation they've been going through a lot of changes I mean um, Steve Abood who's from Dublin left there as well he was doing a lot of work with the, with the academy so again we're not quite sure what's going on behind the scenes but I would have thought Kieran Crowley's building okay you know David Tough draw at the World Cup but you know going forward they're on the right path and now whoever it is comes in like if it's Laurent Labitte that does come in maybe they've been kind of attracted by the big name and stuff whereas continuity could be really really important as well because will it feel like another fresh start post World Cup absolutely it will now maybe that's what it, it, the federation feel like they need but I'd imagine if you ask a lot of the Italian rugby supporters they've been really encouraged with what they've seen in the last few years like they gave Ireland a serious rattle in Rome this year we're unlucky not to push them even more and I think they, team, look, they look decent against France exactly teams are respecting them far more as well and it's not about you know this kind of like pats in the back well done Italy they're playing far far better rugby and you do get the sense that it's not far away from clicking I mean they're a long way off from being a, a world force but they were certainly moving in the right direction so I think it could be a step back for them yep. didn't think we'd be chatting for half an hour about rugby in the <laughs> middle of June but here we are Keen thanks a million Here's well. a reminder again that our rugby coverage here on Off the Ball is with thanks to Vodafone main sponsor of the Irish team we all belong to the team of us. Rugby on Off the Ball with Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us.